Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. When I was eight years old, I came home from Sunday school all lit up, and I said to my mom, did you know that some Jews during Passover don't eat chametz? Can we do that this year? <laughs> she said, I, I did know that, honey, and if it's really important to you, yes, we can do that this year. Uh, but, she said, we're reform, so we'll only do it for three days, not a whole week. So she, she really was supportive. She helped me pack up all of our chametz from the cupboard and put it in the den. And later that week, I was with a friend, and her family took me out to dinner. I didn't quite grasp all of the nuance of refraining from chametz for the week of Pesach, but there I was. And I had soup, and I sprinkled some oyster crackers in the soup. And after eating a few bites, I realized that I was consuming chametz. And I burst into tears in the restaurant. Yeah, I had future rabbi written on my forehead. <laughs> um, and I think I, I didn't have words for faith or transgression or ritual. I didn't have that vocabulary. But I had felt on the outset of refraining from hamates that if I could do this really difficult thing, then I would prove something to myself and, and I would be expressing my faith. And when I ate the oyster crackers, I just felt like it was game over. I had totally failed, and there was just no point in continuing my efforts that Passover. Now, like I mentioned, Shabbat Hagadol is a traditional time to expound upon the laws of Passover. And I will get there, although it will sort of be like me doing the recessional with the Torah. We all know I'll end up there singing Eitz Chaim, but there will be several conversations along the way. <laughs> I started with my chavruta looking at this week's parsha, and there is this beautiful verse about how the priest should consistently keep the fire on the altar burning, that the fire should never go out, and every morning the priest needed to put new wood on it. And when we looked at the interpretation of the verse in the Zohar, a mystical commentary on the Torah, it said, why the priest should be so vigilant about the fire. Because the question in my mind was, well, does it even make sense to keep the fire going if there's nothing on the altar in that moment to burn up? And really, if the fire is extinguished, what's the big deal? You can just relight it again. But the Zohar, in its mystical way, said, oh, no, you must understand there is more than one fire. There is the holy fire burning on our altar, and then there's the ever-present threat of the impure intention. And the impure intention is a fire in itself. And if for one moment the priest shouldn't be vigilant, this fire of impure intention will burn up. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. That seems like a good reason to keep the fire going. But my next question was, what's this impure intention? That seems a little bit vague to me. And, of course, the Zohar has an, offer, an answer to give. So in the time of the tabernacle, there were actually two altars. The first altar was made of bronze. It was out in the courtyard, and that is where the animal sacrifice took place. But there was another more precious altar, a gold altar. And this altar was inside the tabernacle, and that is where the priests would offer up the incense. So Rabbi Abba in the Zohar says, what does the incense have to do with impurity and intention and the flame being maintained? The word incense in Hebrew is ketoret. And Rabbi Abba teaches that the Hebrew root of the word ketoret means to bind up. So Rabbi Abba says it's because we're binding ourselves up in faith. Ah, well, if faith is what we're binding up in the incense on the altar, if that's why we need the ever-present flame, then the impure intention must be doubt, which is a very natural human tendency. We are much more capable of remembering bad things that have happened to us or noticing things that are unpleasant in the world than we are in noticing daily miracles. In fact, it's such an ever-present phenomenon that psychologists have coined the frame a negativity bias meaning it's so much easier to know what's going wrong than know what's going right. But that was <clears throat> some, some of what of a stretch for me, this connection through a Hebrew root of being bound up, it must mean faith, and so the evil or the impure impulse must mean doubt. 
So I started thinking, well, what is the symbolism of incense? We have to initiate it. We are the ones that light the flame, and then the smoke rises up to God. And the same is true of faith. God can fill the world with wonders, but we have to be the initiators of our own faith. God can't make us more faithful people. And it's, um, it's very easy to fall into the darkness, right? We can all have faith when we're holding a new baby in our arms or when we're watching the sunrise over the ocean. But Heschel warns us that even in the darkest periods, we have to shine our inner light forth. He brings this beautiful verse from Proverbs. He says, we rise while it is yet dark. And I've seen this play out. One time, I was listening to Rabbi Julie Schoenfeld address colleagues. She is the head of the Rabbinical Assembly. That's the professional organization to which the majority of conservative rabbis belong. And she was listening to us kvetch. The RA doesn't do this. The RA doesn't do that. And in her very calm, compassionate, but firm way, she looked at us and said, you are the RA. Right? You need to initiate. You need to have faith in this organization. You need to have faith in conservative Judaism. I know you feel like it's a dark time, but it's upon you to initiate. I think we have trouble initiating our own faith because we're convinced that someone else can do it better. Well, we think some people are born with a, a greater sense of faith, or some people are trained, like a rabbi on a bima, to express greater faith. But the truth is, teaches Heschel in God's search for man, that we are all equal in faith. He reminds us that we all stood at Sinai. And Maimonides in the Guide to the Perplexed, he says, don't think for a minute that any one person can grasp the full mysteries of life. For all of us, we get these flashes of insight, and then they're gone, he says, due to our human nature, that negativity bias that psychologists call that impulse to notice what's bad and not what's good. You know, even the greatest Jew who ever lived, Moses, expressed doubt. At the burning bush, God says, you're the man for the job. And Moses says, I don't have faith in myself. I'm slow of tongue. I can't possibly be the person to address Pharaoh. And later in the story, when God has brought manna raining down to the people in the wilderness, they say, we want quail. We don't like what you cooked for dinner. And Moses ends up going to God and saying, I quit. These people are impossible. I have no faith in them. You have chosen the wrong people, God. They do not deserve the promised land. And later in the story, Moses even doubts God. They are thirsty. And God says, speak to the rock and water shall pour forth. But Moses doesn't think that speaking to the rock will work. He doesn't think that God's strong enough, so he gives that rock a good hard whack to make the water flow forth. So if even Moses had doubt, how are we supposed to maintain our faith? Well, Heschel doesn't leave us uh, wondering for long. He says there are two antecedents to being able to initiate on your own personal altar faith rising up to God. And here is what Heschel says. The antecedents are wonder and praise. So wonder, it's the easier of the two, I think. Most of us can feel an inherent sense of wonder in the beauty of the world. But getting into the habit of taking time to praise, right? That's the second part of the verse in Sav. We said that the priest should maintain the fire on the altar by putting wood on it every morning. So when we get in the habit of praise after experiencing wonder, we're like the priest putting wood on the altar and maintaining that smoke rising up to God. All right, how do we do that? Well, fortunately, in Judaism, we have a whole system of ritual and mitzvot to help us notice the wonder. And just such a ritual is coming up on Thursday night. See, I told you I'd get back around to the chametz. So on Thursday night, after we have completely cleaned out our houses of chametz and we're really prepared for Passover, we have a ritual to search out any leftover chametz. And you walk around with a candle so that you have a good light to look for any last crumbs, and a feather so that you can sweep up any last crumbs of chametz and put them away for the holiday. And you do this with blessings. And in our house, we've turned it into a game. So we actually hide chametz 
And we don't hide whole wheat bread. We hide, you know, the good stuff, cookies or brownies. <laughs> um, and you have to remember where you put it, by the way. Otherwise, you'll discover that chametz halfway through Passover. And then we send our children on a search around the house with the candle and the feather to find the chametz. But I have to tell you that by Thursday night, I will not feel like carrying out this ritual. I will have helped clean the shul. I will have made sure that all of my sermons are ready. I will have cleaned my own kitchen. I will have gone to Tom Thumb to get the kosher groceries only to have to go to the kosher Albertsons because they had one item that I need that the store didn't have. I'm tired, and I know you know what I mean. So the thing is, can I be my own initiator of faith? Because I'm doubtful in that moment. Does it really matter if I go through this routine for myself, for my family? Who cares? Does it make a difference in the world? But I have to say that inevitably, my husband has more strength than I do in that moment. And he says, we're searching for the brownies with the feather. Um, and here's what I get out of that moment. It's an affirmation that we're truly ready for Passover. It's creating a moment to savor all of the hard work that's gone into preparing for the holiday. And there's also such a sweetness in watching my children giggle and yelp with glee as they find their treats. Because I know that by us constructing these positive memories, I am telling my children that our rituals are valuable. They fill us with faith. There was no moment in the history of Judaism more filled with faith than a group of raggle-taggle slaves getting up with only matzah on their backs to follow a prophet into the wilderness of the unknown. So that eight-year-old girl that burst into tears when she ate oyster crackers and felt like her fire had been extinguished, she had no faith left, the 37-year-old woman would say to her, you know, I don't think the fire went out. I think it just got reduced to embers. And there's going to be another ritual along in the next five minutes, right? Judaism is all about ritual. Don't worry. There's going to be another ritual for you to reignite your faith and re-engage in your belief that what you can do truly makes a difference to you and those around you and the world. So my prayer for us this Shabbat and this Passover is that it will be chametz free. And by the way, I've printed out, if any of you want to try this mitzvah, an instruction sheet of how you search for chametz. It is on the schnapps table in the kiddush room. So I pray for us that we will be chametz free, and I pray for us that we will find something that lights our fire in the rituals of Passover and keeps our faith ever burning. Shabbat shalom and Chag Sameach.